Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I am your host, Dr. Angela Chester. You know what we like to do here, enlighten, inspire, and empower you to be your best self. The tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches, but a tiny spark can set forest on fire. And today we are talking about your first love. We have author Kelvin Woodard here with us today, and he is out of Blythewood, South Carolina, and we are talking about building a relationship with God. But first, let me tell you a little bit more about Kelvin. Kelvin Woodard, born in Germany to a military family, is the oldest of five children. He is a graduate of Virginia State University with a degree in music education. Major Woodard was commissioned as an officer in the United States Army in 1986, where he served as an infantry, automation, and intelligence officer. He served in combat in Iraq and a tour to the Pentagon as an intelligence analyst. Kelvin is married to Vicki Edwards Woodard, his wife of 27 years, with two children, Amanda and Tiffany. As a musician, he has performed with such artists as James Bignon, Vicki Winans, LaShawn Pace Rhodes, and Paul S. Morton. The Lord called Kelvin to ministry in 1997. He was ordained as an elder in 2005 and appointed as associate pastor in 2011. Elder Kelvin Woodard is currently retired from the military. Elder Woodard serves as an associate pastor, a musician who plays the saxophone, and a director of education at the Church Teaching Center in Columbia, South Carolina. God has called him to teach the word with clarity to bring the body of Christ together across all boundaries and develop the character of Christ in his people. So without any further ado, let's get Elder Woodard on the show. Good morning, good morning. How are you? Thank you so much for joining me today on Daily Spark. Uh, Good morning to you. I am well. Thank you for having me on the show. Thank you. Now, I love all of the things that you have done, all of the things that you are doing, and I I just can't wait to hear the nuggets of wisdom that you are going to be able to share with us today. So I have to ask you, what inspired you to write First Love? Well, for short answer, the Holy Spirit. But it didn't start off as me writing a book. It was part of what I normally do in my um, study of the Word. Um, One of the things that is near and dear to me is God's Word and the the understanding and the revelation of His Word. And so during my normal um, study uh, process, I just began to uh, research some things that that, I, that I've heard. Uh, sometimes my, my, my wife would get at me because I always ask her questions like, what does that mean? Where did that come from? What's the etymology mm-hmm. of this and, and that? Mm-hmm. And so I'd like to dig into the Word to find out those things. And the thing is that uh, as I began to uh, study certain aspects of the Word, it just led me from one place to the Bible to another place. The next thing I know, I was all over the Bible. And by the mm-hmm. time I finished, I had 60 pages um, wow. that became a manuscript. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And don't you just love it when God gives you something and you didn't realize you were being given something, you know, in the, in the process? It's like, oh, wow, thank you so much for that. So 66 pages later, what kind of book would you say your book is? I think it was, it's definitely a biblically based book. Uh, one person described it as a uh, reverential work. What it is, it's a serious work about having a relationship um, with God. Being in leadership, um, being in leadership with different in different churches, like as I as you alluded to um, earlier, I'm um, I'm retired military, so I've traveled often, and so from from one duty station to the to the other duty station. I was usually in some form of leadership in the church. And one of the things that, that I notice is that um, the, the church body or the church membership uh, repeat a lot of things that they have heard, but 
they don't repeat what they have studied. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and because of that, there is a lot of information that is um, circling within the church community that isn't quite accurate. And so when you hear the misquotes being uh, promulgated, then uh, you, you, you kind of get this feeling of, okay, they haven't studied it because they're repeating what somebody else has, has, uh, has said. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and so my, my thing is that we, we need to know the God that we, that we say we serve. Yes. Yes, yes. Now, kind of going off into off into that vein of knowing the God that we serve. Um, would you say that the reader of your book would be able to utilize your book as a devotional? Like, should they can they sit down and every day take take a bite, if you will, and be able to digest it, or is it more like a novel where they need to read a chapter at a time? I would say it's more like a novel where they need to read a chapter at a time. But then when you read it, then go back and let it, um, let it take you on a journey into the Word. That's really what I would, I would, like, to, uh, I would like to see uh, or hear that people are doing, that it, would, um, that it would cause them to go seek God the more. Mhm, mhm, mhm. I like that. Now, when when the reader sits down and they've decided, okay, I am committing to this book, and I and I say that because I think it's really important for people to realize that we don't want you to just pick up a book and call words. We really and truly want you to spend time with the book so that you can have an understanding of of what you're reading. What will the reader find? Like, are there are two or three? Uh, main themes or main points that that you hope that the reader can take away from your book? I I believe that um, all of the points are are made will really show the love of the love that God has for us and how he has so individually loved us. Mm -hmm. So because he wants us to individually love him. What they will find is one, they will find revelation. They will find that it will bring attention to sayings that we thought were Bible verses but aren't. For mm-hmm. instance, and, and, and I don't know if this is a predominantly African-American so-called quote, but the race is, isn't given to the swift or the strong, but the he do not do it to the end. That's not a Bible. That's not a Bible verse. Um, also, Saul's name was never changed to Paul. Uh, you will also find that it is a sincere plea to, to know God for yourself. This is not in the book, but I have it in a, in a bookmarker that accompanies the book. And just to preface the statement, it's not for sensationalism. I make a comment that God wants, to know, wants us to know him for ourselves personally, not vicariously through our pastors and church leaders. In other words, you want the pastor to have a relationship with God, and let me live my life the way I want to until I need God. Then I go to the pastor and seek God's guidance. I liken that to a husband and wife, and the husband, instead of knowing the wife for himself, he tells someone else to know her. And then when he wants to know something about her, he will ask that person. Now, that sounds so, uh, how does that sound so bad? But it sounds okay for us to have that kind of relationship with God. Mm-hmm. And, and those are the kinds of things that I, I try to bring um, to, the, to, the, uh, to the forefront. Um, there, there are no group tickets to heaven. <laughs> for, this, for this event, you have to purchase your ticket in person. No one can purchase it for you. Mm-hmm. And the ticket office is found at the foot of the cross. The ticket is free, but it's going to cost you everything. And that's what I want the people to know. Mm-hmm. I love that answer. So what have, when you go on your tours and you are out and about and you hear um, from the various readers of your book, 
what type of feedback have you been have you been getting about the book? Well, the, the feedback I've received is, is good. I haven't really heard anything negative. I have do I, I do have some um, I guess journalists out there that, that looks at some of the uh, they, they 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 question maybe some of the grammatics in it, but. Uh, I, but I have had some people that challenge some of the conclusions that, that, that I've made. Um, the, the one thing that I, um, uh, that I am grateful of is there's a, there's a group out there, actually a good friend of mine that has a gospel chat line, and they're using the, the book as a study tool. Mm-hmm. But the most rewarding um, comment that came from a relative of mine, a relative that had been going through a difficult family situation, and to my knowledge, she was the one that purchased my book first. Mm-hmm. Uh, but she, what she did was she purchased it, and, you know, she, she's a relative, so she purchased it out of um, support to me, but not, mm-hmm. I don't believe, so much for the intention of reading to get anything out of it, you know. <laughs> um, but she came to a point within... Um, her, her fa- the struggle that she was having, um, this family crisis, that she just decided she was going to give up on God and, turn, and, and go back into the world. Mm-hmm. And she said that she was uh, um, cleaning, cleaning her house, and she saw the book. And she decided uh, to pick the book up and read it. She said she was about halfway through the book. Mm-hmm. And she said it was the reading of the book that turned her heart back to God. And, wow. to, and and for 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 me, um, mm-hmm. that's worth um, any amount of book sales mm-hmm. or anything. And that was and that's the reason that I, I I wrote the book, and that's the reason that I that I had it published because I want the people to see God and 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 pursue and know that God loves them regardless, and also that God is always with us, even. See, we have sometimes we have problems with the uh, with the tragedies of life, and we have this thing where we often um, question God uh, about why did this have to happen or why did this happen? Mm-hmm. And you know what? The one thing that that I have learned and, is that when you say that God is sovereign, what you're really saying is that. He's sovereign, and he can do what he wants to do, when he wants to do it, the way he wants to do it, and he doesn't owe me an explanation. And I don't really, if, uh, in all honesty, if I, if I really understand my relationship, I don't really have a right to question him. Um, and that's kind of really what God was telling Job. And as a matter of fact, speaking of Job, that, uh, if you think about it, in the uh, chronology of, a, of events in the Bible, Job would come somewhere between the, uh, I believe, the 12th and the 13th um, chapter of Genesis. The one thing about Job is there is no connection. Job has no connection to any other book in the Bible. And it's interesting how it was just stuck in there. And it's really about this guy's life. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that, that, and and I, I've only heard this from one other um, minister, and this was probably only about maybe a month or so ago. But God, God has this meeting of his sons, and Satan shows up. And God says, like, what are you doing here? Satan says, uh, I'm, I'm going to and fro. And he, then God replies with, have you considered my servant Job? And I've, and I've always wondered, why would God, why would that be the response to the statement that, that Satan makes? But, but if, you, if you continue reading the Bible, mm-hmm. you find that there, there is a scripture that says that he, like a roaring lion, he goes to and fro throughout the earth. So when he said, when he told God, I'm, I'm going up and down, what he was really telling God is, I'm looking for somebody to destroy. And that's, and so now, the conversation makes sense. God saying, uh, "I got somebody that that you can test if you want. His name is Job." Mm-hmm. And and so, the, the, uh, oftentimes the tragedy that we go through, we we can't seem to find God in it. And I hope that one of the things that this book does is allows a person to look at the tragedy 
and see the God in it so that they could know, just like Stephen, when he was being stoned, said that he looked up and he saw the Lord standing with his arms wide open. And oftentimes we would, uh, we would look at that and say, you know, he's, he has all this power and he has all this ability. Why won't he save him? Because he's sovereign and he can do it the way he wants to. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we have to take a very short break here, and I, I want to ask you so many more questions because this is, this is good information here. I want to make sure that folks are able to pick up a copy of the book, Elder Water. Where should they go to get a copy? Okay, there are two places they can go. Uh, my, my publisher is uh, Westbow Press, and so they can go to Westbow. Westpo Press, that's W-E-S-T-B-O-W-P-R-E-S-S dot -E -S com, and click on where it says bookstore, and in the search window, type in First Love, Kelvin Woodard, and, uh, and, and you have to put my name in there because there is another book out there titled, um, first, uh, has a First Love title to it also, mm -hmm. and you can either purchase the e-book for three ninety nine or the soft cover for nine ninety five, or you can go to my uh, author website, which is the word of God com, and it's going to take you to um, the uh, Westbow Press publishing site, but it's going to go to my landing page, and the only mm -hmm. thing that's going to be there is, is my book, and you can make the choice of whether to get the ebook or the uh, soft cover. All right. Well, listeners, we'll be back right after this. Back with Dr. Angela. I'm your host, Dr. Angela Chester. We are speaking with Elder Kelvin Woodard, and he is out of the South Carolina uh, area, but he's an author, and the name of his book is First Love. So we're talking about building a relationship with God today. So, Elder Woodard, how did you come up with the title First Love? Well, I, uh, I, 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 I grew, I've grown up in church all my life. And I've always, I've always had this, this curious mind, um, very analytical, which has also played against me in, in listening to the Spirit over, over time. Um, and I, I've had to be kind of retrained. But I um, always heard, or, you know, sang the song, you know, we, uh, we love him because he first loved us. And uh, out of John... First uh, John 4 and 9 says, we love him because he first loved us. And Revelation 2, 4 says, I have somewhat, uh, somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. And while, while reading that, um, I'm looking at the time span between uh, what we say is the act of God's love. And I also did a uh, survey uh, before I put it, before I uh, published the book, and I've asked uh, friends and relatives and, and those within the church community, uh, what is the event that say God loves us? And of course, everyone points to the crucifixion. And so I looked at how does time play um, in validating that? Because I'm looking at the at creation and I'm looking at the time. Uh, that the crucifixion took place, and I'm saying, you know, that's at, that's at, at a minimum at least 4,000 years. That's a long time before you tell somebody you love them. And so I began to start looking for the, the, uh, the, the kind of world event that took place or the event that took place where, where God said, I love you, in the before the cru crucifixion. So as I began to research, I, I, I began to look at creation and come, to, and come to understand that God created heaven and earth, but he has no need for either. He, 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 he exists all by himself. So he, doesn't, so he doesn't need an earth, nor does he need a heaven, but... Mm -hmm. But and, and he doesn't per se live on the earth or live off of the earth. Mm -hmm. So what did he create create it for? Uh, and, and here's the other thought. When God said, 
when the Bible says in Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth, and he said, and God said, let there be light. What was the prompt to cause him to say, let there be light? What was he, what was he trying, what did he want to do or what he want to create? And in my research, um, I, I make a point in the book that what God did was he created his bride. He, because he made man in his likeness and his image, then he became the model for man. So when God said that man should not be alone, what he also said but didn't say was, I, God, should not be alone. And he created his, his, he created his own bride when he made man. And so, that, so in Revelation 22, you see, um, and, and there are other scriptures where, where you see him reference to the, uh, to the body of Christ as his bride. And that is why it is so important that, uh, that when he said, be ye holy for I am holy, um, that's not um, a, a request. And one thing I learned in the military is that when a commander speaks, uh, not only does what he say have uh, legal uh, implications and ramifications, mm -hmm. also when a commander speaks, he does not make suggestions. He commands, and what he and what he and what he says, just as mm -hmm. a king does when he mm -hmm. speaks, it becomes law. Mm -hmm. And so God wasn't asking us to uh, be holy. He was. He is requiring that we be holy because the word says that holiness without no man shall see the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to um, writing and you determining that I am going to be an author, even though it didn't initially maybe um, start off that way, you know, you ended up with the manuscript and then you decided that this was going to be uh, more than just uh, words on a page. Uh, how did you determine that, yes, this is going, this is going to be a book and do I have a writing background that I can kind of push along with this book? What made you decide that that was how you were going to proceed? <laughs> Interesting question. Because uh, I never, like, like, you, like you just said, I never considered myself a writer. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, up until that point, I, hadn't, I haven't really done anything, hadn't done anything that was writing specific or significant. Uh, the... This, this, of course, this is my first book, and the only other consistent writing I have done was in the military as a staff officer. I would have to write my portion of what, uh, what's called the operation orders, and, and just to, um, not, to, not to get so much into, into military terminology, but everything that the military does, they, they publish orders in order to do it. Mm -hmm. And so... I had I have a piece that I had a piece as a staff officer that I had to prepare um, for my portion of, of of that kind of order. The the other um, uh, place that I have had a, a more consistent uh, writing focus was when I was stationed at the Pentagon. I wrote the uh, daily executive summary for our task force that went to the uh, Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and this is what I did um, every day on the job. And secondly, uh, writing in preparation for uh, Bible study, Sunday school, and for uh, mm -hmm. sermons. But outside of that, I have, I've had nothing um, um, consistent or um, significant. But part of the reason I went forth with the book was because one, there was a prompting in my spirit, and also I, I, be, I had began to start, um, I'm not going to say it was often, but every now and then um, someone would come across and speak a word into my life about me writing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. since I had these 66 uh, pages, I said, <laughs> well, this, this probably should be the, be the beginning of that. <laughs> that, so that's how I got started. <laughs> like, yeah, I think this might be something. <laughs> I can I said, I can understand that. Now, you know how we have that age old question, which came first, the, the chicken or the egg? So I have to ask you, which came first, the title of the book 
or the actual pages of the book? The actual pages uh, came first. I, I had been um, diving and I, I, I had so many different um, kind of titles along the way. And first love was the only one that seemed to uh, to fit because and it, and it really kind of sets the tone for uh, for everything else. If you really look at it, um, the word says that God is love, and so what that really means is that his, his that D, that his DNA is love, and so that everything that God does, he does out of love. Um, sometimes we don't recognize what that love looks like because sometimes mm-hmm. it, it could be a little harsh to us. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes it can, you know, sometimes, and, and, and like I was speaking earlier, sometimes we don't see God's love in tragedy. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's kind of hard for us to see oftentimes. But uh, when the word says that God is love, that means that everything that he does, everything, um, mm-hmm. that his, his being is love. And everything that comes out of him is love. And that's why um, that the, the word says that love is the fulfilling of the, of, of the fruits of the Spirit. Mm-hmm. Because, because that is the only real way to exemplify and represent Christ is love. It says that uh, they'll know that you, are, um, that, that you are my disciples because of how you love each other. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, it's so interesting that you say that, that if we really sit down and pay attention to the words that are written before us and don't try to take away or add to, um, then it really interestingly speaks, speaks volumes to us. And it, it really and truly is about love. And we sometimes really need to have a mind shift when it comes to that and, and stop trying to put more on God or take anything away from him when he simply is love. And, and I, I love that, that concept. Exactly. And even mm-hmm. if I could, if I could make an a, a, a additional comment, mm-hmm. even um, when we, we, we often say um, that um, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And, mm-hmm. and we say that from the standpoint of our joy, but the phrase that we're saying is the joy mm-hmm. of the Lord. Mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm. when you research the joy of the Lord and you research that word joy, that word joy is to be in union with. Mm-hmm. And when you, when you're, and so when the word says that because of the joy that was set before Christ, he was able to endure the cross. He was able to endure the cross because the joy that he saw on the other end of the cross mm-hmm. was, to, was, the, was to be in union with you and I. Mm-hmm. 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 I'm so glad you. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because, boy, sometimes folks really need to be reminded that it's not. It's not about us. It is about what God wants to give to us, and uh, we really need to just kind of stand and accept that, and and, and stop trying to do all these other stuff. Uh, for for my listeners, I know you guys know I'm gonna say it. It's like you know we need to stop telling God how to be God. You know, God is God all by Himself. He does not need for us to to try to teach Him how how to do it. Now we have about. Um, Three minutes or so uh, left in this particular segment, but I want to um, I want to ask if if you would like to, and I know that we don't want to give away too much, but did you want to share any excerpts of the book, or was there any particular passage or anything that perhaps you wanted to share with our listeners? Well, I, I was there is let I would let me tell you a story. Um, if we have time later, and, and the only reason I say it is because uh, there's something I, I wrote the eulogy for my grandfather, okay. and it's uh, it's what the Lord gave me one day when I was at work, and okay. just to tell you the story of how of how, mm-hmm. of how it started is um, I was at work and the Lord just started downloading information to me, just start downloading mm-hmm. information uh, about my grandfather, and so mm-hmm. I just start, I started writing it out, and he titled it Shoes. Hmm. And so I am, uh, I'm, uh, we were at the end of a church service, getting ready to go home, 
And as the people were leaving, the pastor got the mic and said, I heard the Lord say shoes. Wow. He said, he said I don't know whether somebody needs shoes or somebody wants some shoes, somebody needs to get some shoes. He said shoes. And as soon as he said that, I knew yeah. exactly what, 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 he was, what, what God was saying to me. And I went well, to him and I said, definitely. Yeah. 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 I, I went to him and I said, that's what. Yes, is, I went to him and said, he's letting me know my grandfather's about to pass. Yes, yes. And, and when, well, I'm listeners, sorry. No, no, we need to take a very short break right here, but when we get back, we are definitely going to finish this story. We'll be back right after this. Back. Thank you so much for joining me for Daily Spark with Dr. Angela. I'm your host, Dr. Angela Chester. My guest today is Elder Kelvin Woodard, and he is the author of First Love. So we are talking about building a relationship with God today. Now, Elder Woodard, you were you were saying how um, the pastor says I'm supposed to say the word shoes. It, does someone need shoes? But that was that was really code to you and you knew that God was really speaking directly at you. Please continue your story. Yes, and I'm going to I'm going to tell you what happened at the end. Like I said, this was a, a eulogy that the, that the Lord had given me for my grandfather. Uh so I'm going to tell you the end. Then I'm going to read this uh it, 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 it's not very long. Um but but I think I would like you I like you to hear um to kind of get a feel of how I got how I got to this place. Um, while I was reading it at the funeral, I, unbeknownst to me, because I'm I'm I'm, I'm really kind of nervous and kind of probably a little okay. teared up myself. Okay. I'm, I'm reading it, and when I finish reading it, I look out in the audience, and every man in the room is somewhere prostrate on the floor, mm-hmm. laid out before the Lord, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. weeping and, and crying. And I didn't know, I had no idea of what, it, what was going on, but this is it here. This is how I started. Um, I took a pair of my grandfather's shoes, and I asked permission. Um, I believe I put something down to, just, just to make sure. But um, mm-hmm. I took a pair of his shoes, and I put it on the podium. Mm-hmm. And then I began to read. To my grandfather, affectionately known as Deke, officially Deacon Forrest Johnson, Job 1 1 says, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. This scripture is the only thing and the only example I've ever known of my grandfather. Some have called this a poem, but these are the words given to me by the Holy Spirit, recited and read at his funeral, entitled Shoes. With permission, I placed a pair of his shoes on the podium and began to read the following. Forrest Johnson, my grandfather, he wore a size 11 shoe, I wore a size 12, yet his shoes were too big for my feet. Mm -hmm. At the end of his journey here on earth, he was bound by a wheelchair, yet he stood taller than any man I know. I can't tell you of all the places that these shoes traveled. I can't tell you how rough the road, how tedious the journey, or how long the path. But I do know that their steps were ordered by the Lord. These shoes walked walked some lonely roads stood in some lonely places, not because there were no people around, but because they were shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. These shoes did not have secret rendezvous with strange women. They couldn't be found in a club or a bar, nor would they have been seen in the halls of the sea. These shoes came home at night. They were found at work early in the morning, many times before the break of day. They were not slothful. slothful. They didn't make excuses and they stayed true to their word. I had to come to the understanding that the size of a man was not measured in feet and inches, but in the character in which he lived. My admiration for him was not for the things he had, but for the word he lived. These shoes climbed the rough sides of the mountain so that I wouldn't have to. They took a journey on the road less traveled so that my journey could be easier. These shoes didn't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor did they stand in the stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful. These shoes were patient and kind. They were, they were not easily provoked. 
They were not puffed up. They didn't delight themselves in, um, they delighted themselves in the way of the Lord. Whenever there was a church service, these shoes would be found 10 to 20 minutes early. They didn't believe in being late. They didn't care to be seen. They just wanted to be at their appointed place. And on that faithful Saturday evening, he heard the voice of the Lord call his name, saying, Son, it's time to come home. It's time for you to rest. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. You fought a good fight. You finished the course. You've kept the faith. And as he stretched forth his hand to take that step from mortal to immortality, I can hear the Lord saying, you can't come up here with those shoes on. You're going to have to take them off for the ground you stand on is holy ground. Leave the shoes behind as a memorial to all that will see them, that they will know that you walk with me until you were not. For a man this great should have should leave shoes too big for the feet of the generations that will follow. He did not leave material wealth for his treasure was stored in heaven above, which money could not buy. But what he did leave was a wealth of faith, perseverance, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, kindness, a wealth of truthfulness, integrity, wisdom, honor, and strength. The story of these shoes can't end here. These shoes must continue to tell the story of a man who spent his life faithfully in the service of the God for whom he put his trust. These shoes can't be filled by the feet of one person alone, but if these shoes will walk again, it's going to take the feet of every family member to come together. Despite differences and past dealings, if once again to show, the, show, show forth the greatness of the man that stood in them. He was a man of few words who didn't waste time talking about what he was going to do. He just did it. And in the words of Benjamin Franklin, well done is better than well said. Well done, Granddad. Well done. Our patriarch and our Isaac, Forrest Johnson, Deke, husband, father, grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather, uncle, brother-in-law, friend, from all of us to you, thank you for leaving shoes. Mm -hmm. I love it. I love it, and what a wonderful, um, though, it's a, though it's a eulogy, but what a wonderful tribute to the life of your grandfather for any reader that, that reads that or for anyone who gets to hear that, that, you know, he was, he was such a, a great person that made a difference in your life. You know, it, that, that's really, really awesome. I, I love that. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. Uh, as, as you were reading that, and uh, I know that uh, my show is Faith Talk Radio, but for, for anyone who sees your book on the shelf at a, their local bookstore, would you say that your book is only geared towards the, those who are of the Christian faith, or is your book for anyone at any moment in their life to simply pick up a copy and start reading? Well, you know, I, I would have said, um, had I not had uh, some feedback from, from some people, uh, that it was probably only for the Christian, and, and for the great majority of those, it, it is um, for Christians, because, um, as you know, that the Spirit of God is only revealed uh, the, by God, and so... Uh, the problem that the world has is they are trying to understand God with their mind, and you can't do that. That's why the Word says you must worship him in spirit and in truth, because it's the only the spirit um, of God within you that can properly worship him, because it, it is the only thing that, that we have that understands the, uh, the, the, the greatness of, of, of who God is. The truth is our mind can't fathom God, and we can't, uh, our mind cannot wrap itself around, how do you have somebody that uh, has no beginning, has no end, because everything mm -hmm. in our world is finite, so mm -hmm. it would be, it would be probably difficult for someone that is not a believer, but mm -hmm. there is enough faith, as the word says, that we, he has given all of us a measure of faith. There's another, enough faith in it 
and and Bible basis in it that uh, the faith that that the faith in them can connect to the faith in the book and mm-hmm. cause them to want to pursue and to know God. Mm-hmm. That is a, I, I love that I love that I love that answer. That's that's really awesome. When we when we look at the impact that your book has made on the lives of all of the readers. Um, I have to ask, what do you what do you believe is the future for you? Are you going to write more books? Are you um, are you going to turn this into so much more? What do you believe God has um, in in the future for you? Well, um, you know, I I have most of my life up until um, I began to write this book. I've been playing with different um, artists as they come to town or I would go to, to wherever they are and, and play with them. And, and there have been uh, numerous words spoken over my life about um, me and music. And so I have always looked at music as being the thing that God was going to use to bring me before the pe- before people. Mm-hmm. But now I am seeing that, uh, at least as I believe, that he's going to use the book to bring me before the people, and that's mm-hmm. going to be the kind of Kickstarter for uh, my, my, uh, my music. But the thing is, uh, I started writing my second book mm-hmm. uh, literally uh, uh, within a week after, uh, after this one was published. And, uh, and, and what God had in me is a, a series of commentaries. I, I still don't know how, they're gonna, how it's going to be broken down, but there are definitely uh, more books in me and more books um, that will be written. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love it. I absolutely love it. So we are just about out of time, but I want to make sure that people are able to not only get a copy of your book, but follow you if you're on social media and all of that. So if you would, please, Elder Woodard, let everyone know how can they get in contact with you? How do they follow you on the internet? Uh, they can they can follow me um, and and get and get my book uh, through. My publisher, which is Westbo Press, that's W-E-S-T-B-O-W-P-R-E-S-S, um, dot com, and there's a section that says bookstore. You can click on the book. You can click on um, the uh, bookstore, the link, and it will take you um, to where you can input in a search. What you need to do in the, in the search, you need to put in First Love and my name. And the reason for also including my name is because there's another book out there uh, with, a, with a title, First Love, in it. Um, and then it will um, allow you to purchase either the e-book for $3.99 or the soft cover book for $9.95. Or you can go to my author website, which is thewordofgodrevealed.com, and that will take you to also take you to Westboro Press, but it will take you to my landing page, and that and the only options you will have there is the ebook and the um, soft cover book. That's how you can get in contact with me. And in the future, I believe uh, since this is has already been established, this is probably uh, where I will also use to um, for for other works that I will do to include my, uh, the, the music that I plan to start in, uh, in a CD project in June. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, listeners, thank you so much for spending time with Elder Woodard and I. And Elder Kelvin Woodard, thank you for spending time with me and my listeners today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anderson. And as always, everyone, may the Lord continue to shine his face upon you. May you receive his grace and his mercy in all you do. Until next time, have a great week, everyone. Bye-bye.